<clears throat> okay, are we there? Can you guys hear me? I'm hoping for somebody to give me a thumbs up somehow. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> be great to know if I can be heard. Hello there, yes, you can hear me, brilliant. I've got at least two people online, that's awesome. Uh, brilliant. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm super excited about this. Yes, we're all here. We're here. We're live. This is really exciting. Um, welcome to Earth Live's lesson. I'm Serene Sumner. and uh, I'm here to persuade you over the next 15, 20 minutes or so to love wasps. And these are reasons to love wasps. So first of all, I'd like to thank Lizzie hugely for inviting or agreeing to have me on, give me the opportunity to talk to you all today um, about wasps. And, and I think particularly um, because wasps are kind of that unloved organism, aren't they? And, and I'd like to have a sort of virtual show of hands now. If you, if you don't like wasps, just put your hand up in your living room now. Yeah, I thought so. There's quite a few of you, aren't there? I'm really sorry. Um, and I hope that over the next 20 minutes, I can persuade you to like wasps a little bit more. Um, so what to expect over the next 20 minutes? Well, I'm going to try and give you some top trump cards, if you like, on why you should like wasps. Yes, I can see your comments. You're telling me there's a cascade of comments about why you hate that you hate wasps. I'm going to give you some reasons to actually what like wasps. But first of all, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Serian Sumner. I am a behavioural ecologist at University College London. And I've spent probably much of the last 20 years studying wasps. Now, the reason I got into wasps was a bit of a funny story, actually. Um, I didn't, I have to confess, I didn't actually like wasps. When I was young, I actually actively avoided creepy crawlies. I didn't even, I couldn't tell a bee from a wasp. Goodness me, that's a confession, isn't it? I couldn't tell a bee from a wasp. I, um, in fact, I guess I was the archetypal um, zoologist in that I really loved the fluffy bunny biology by uh, animals. I liked the meerkats. I loved watching David Attenborough programs. Um, I loved bird watching. I liked the, the large animals that you could really relate to a lot more. Um, I went to UCL, University College London, to study zoology, um, mainly because I really liked animal behaviour and I had a really good course on animal behaviour at the time. And I spent my, uh, my three years at UCL really falling in love with research and still loving animal behaviour. Um, but I didn't really think anything about insects at all until I was offered the opportunity to take on a PhD role and uh, a research uh, degree, and it was on animal behaviour. Yay, I was so excited to be offered a PhD place to study animal behaviour. There was just this small issue, and the issue was that the animal that I was to study was not the cute, adorable meerkat or mongoose or even a long-tailed tit. No, nothing pretty, nothing beautiful. It was a wasp. And I have to say, I was slightly duped into studying these insects um, because the guy who turned out to be my PhD supervisor, uh, Dr. Jeremy Field, he told me in no uncertain terms that the wasps that I was going to study didn't sting. No, 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 these wasps don't sting. You'll be absolutely fine. Don't worry. No, 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 no. Completely dismiss the matter because I know for sure I was totally like you. The first thing I thought of when you said the word wasp to me is that I'd think about sting. I think about being stung. Nobody wants to be stung, do they? And wasps are renowned for that spiky bit at the bottom of their abdomen, the bottom of their bottom, the bit that makes us all feel quite unwell and run away from them and picnics. So I was actually your classic flappy wasp hater. And yet I still took on this, uh, this PhD role as uh, studying uh, wasps. And the reason was that I was really interested in the questions because I was fascinated in how and why animals behave. So 
I think you've got a bit of that in you as well, which is probably why you're here listening to this fabulous series of Lizzie's, because you're wondering about the outside world. You're wondering about the rich diversity of wildlife that you see around you. So I'm going to ask you now to get up off your chair and take a look underneath the sofa. Don't tell your parents. Just have a quick peek. Go on. Off you go. Now. If your sofa is anything like mine, there's probably quite a lot of wildlife underneath it. You might see some spiders. There might be some tiny little flies, maybe. Um, there'll certainly be some cobwebs and there'll be some evidence of life under your sofa. And you've probably never thought to look there again, but after this talk, I want you to have another, go back to your sofa and have a look, because underneath there, there will be some organisms that are expressing behaviors that will be interesting. So have you ever noticed um, flies hanging from your ceiling and kind of waving slightly? Yeah? Or perhaps birds on your bird table outside. You've uh, wondered why they jump from one feeder to the other or why they flip back and forth. These are all behaviours. These are all products of evolution. The reason that these animals perform these behaviours is because they will be in some way beneficial to them. And the study of behaviour, of animal behaviour, is all about understanding how and why animals behave in the way that they do. And so those are the questions that really excited me all those years ago when I first stumbled across the world of wasps. Um, so I was able to overlook the fact that they were wasps uh, because of the really interesting behaviours that they were, were showing. And these are social wasps that I was studying. And I do still study social wasps today. And the really fascinating thing about social insects, social wasps, is, well, actually, let's now draw an analogy with bees, OK? For, so just for now... I am going to allow you to think about bees, okay? And I don't often do this because I prefer to make people not think about bees because I want you to think about wasps. So bees, bees are truly amazing. And the reason why you think bees are amazing are probably because you're thinking about the honeybee. And what could be more amazing than the honeybee? We have this uh, beautiful queen, who is basically an egg laying machine. She pumps out millions of eggs over her lifetime of many years, often up to 20 years. And those eggs are all fertilized by different, lots of different fathers. So a female, a queen bee will mate with about 10, 10 males, maybe more males. And she'll store the sperm from those matings in a little sack in her abdomen called the spermatheca. And she uses those sperm to fertilize the eggs. And from that, she produces this enormous colony with thousands of her offspring, who are her daughters, who help raise the brood that are going to become the new queens and the new males, the sexual brood. And that is a product, that is an example of social evolution. The bee colony is a society. If you like, it's like a bee colony is, is like your own body. It's like different parts of your body have different tissues that perform different roles. Well, it's exactly the same in a bee colony. You have different individuals performing different roles. So one of the questions that I was really, I have been really fascinated by for over 20 years now, and what really got me hooked in the first place on wasps, was trying to understand why these animals are able to live in these societies. How did they, how did they evolve? And why are some individuals in these societies not reproducing? Why, why do these worker bees choose not to reproduce and instead they help? others reproduce. That makes no sense. We should all be trying to reproduce because the whole purpose of life is to pass on your genes to the next generation. And if you're not reproducing, then you can't do that. So that's the bee story that I always like to start with because I know that you care about bees. I know that you care about bees because they pollinate. And I know that you care about bees because they make honey for your breakfast in the morning not just for you, but they make honey that's very useful to you as a person. But the really interesting thing about bees, the reason why they are so good at pollinating and so good at making all this honey is because they are social colonies, they're societies, they are this new level of individuality, a super organism. Well, here's the news to you. Wasps do that as well. 
Wasps form these huge super colonies. In fact, you know, you already know this. You have seen super colonies of wasps in your garden, okay? If you live in the Northern Hemisphere, um, you will have, you will know of a wasp as the yellow jacket, the yellow and black striped wasp that bothers you at your picnics, it gets in your beer and the beer gardens and your, your, your juice and your lollipops in the summer. That is what you think of as a wasp. Now you hate that wasp because you think it's out to get you, it's out to sting you, but actually next time you see one of those wasps, take a step back and say to yourself, I know that you are a small cog in the big machine of the super organism that is that wasp society. You could say the same to a bee, but it's much more fun if you do it for a wasp, because I know that you already probably don't like wasps very much. So that's the reason why I started studying wasps, because I wanted to understand what made these societies tick. How is it that you can evolve um, these big societies, these super organisms? Um, and where do they come from? You, they didn't just magic up. They're a product of evolution. So the wasps that I was studying as a PhD student, where I first fell in love with wasps, this is a love affair story, by the way, my love affair with wasps, was because the wasps that I was studying uh, lived in the jungles of, South, of uh, Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, and they were examples of the very first types of societies that evolution had ever produced. So if you like, they're the primitive form of the yellow jacket superorganism or the honeybee superorganism. Um, and it was those questions that really hooked me. I wanted to understand how and why the amazing social behavior of insects can arise. So the next thing I knew, I was on a plane to Malaysia and with my supervisor, Jeremy Field. And uh, and then I found myself, I was, I was swept away actually, isn't it? I mean, anyone who loves biology and loves the natural world, you want to go, you have this romantic image of going off to some far flung tropical country with the palm trees and the beaches and the amazing wildlife, mostly you're thinking large mammals and beautiful birds. And nobody would turn down the opportunity to go to the tropics and study animal behavior. But these animals were very, very small. They are about this big. They're called hover wasps. And, and actually, it turns out that my PhD supervisor was sort of right in that these wasps, they can sting, but their sting is actually, it's like a little tickle. And you really wouldn't notice it and unless they fall down your, your neck, which they do. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, or your sleeve, which they do tell you about that in a minute. Um, unless they really get to the soft parts of your skin, you're really not going to feel uh, a sting. It is a fragrant, ephemeral tickle, a loving tickle, if you like. And it was this very tickle that I fell, uh, fell in love with, really. I, was, I found myself lying on the jungle floor of a Malaysian rainforest uh, with a wasp nest just above my face, and I had my little torch, because you need a torch to look at the wasps, and each of these wasps, there were only about six or seven wasps on the nest, each wasp I had lovingly painted, yes, painted with, uh, you know, the model aircraft paints that you use to make to paint your little models? Uh, with Airfix paints, I had lovingly painted each individual wasp with her own individual markings. And uh, from that, I was able to follow the the social life of these insects and by watching them I realized it's like a soap opera it's incredible you're watching uh wasp number two or blue colored wasp fight wasp number green or number three green wasp and they are fighting because they're in a contest because at these very early stages of sociality all these individuals within the society can all be queens how do I paint a wasp? I know, isn't it awesome? You must be thinking I'm totally mad, but I have to say it is one of the most useful skills I have ever learned. Somebody just asked me on the chat, how do I paint a wasp? It's very simple. You can try it with a wasp in your garden or a bee. Um, you get your pot of paint and just a, a, a dressmaker's pin and you pop it into the, the pot and then you've got a tiny dot of paint on the end and you put it on the thorax, which is like this part of the wasp, the, the, the back of the wasp here. And we can, we can actually fit three, four, five, six different colored marks on the back of the wasp. And that's how we tell them apart. 
And so actually that was where I fell in love with the soap opera of wasps. And by studying these different uh, lives of the wasps and how they interact and who is the queen, and if you remove the queen, then one of the workers will become the queen. That really got me hooked on understanding the building blocks of social evolution and wasps. Now, I've realised I rambled on for quite a lot of time about something that I didn't really intend to occupy the entire session with. So I'm going to move on very quickly now to some wasp top facts. So first of all, the top reason why you should love wasps, if you're not rocked by the social evolution story, then the top reason you should like wasps is because they are nature's pest controllers. They are predators. Um, in fact, they are the origin of all bees and ants as well. So the, or the original bee was a predator, a hunter, just like a wasp. In fact, bees are wasps that have forgotten how to hunt. They're vegetarian predators. They hunt all the other organisms that you probably hate almost as much as wasps. So that might be aphids, caterpillars, eating your lettuces in the garden, um, uh, spiders, they love eating, so they love catching spiders. Um, cockroaches, oh my goodness, I hate cockroaches. I really hate cockroaches. And I was so excited to hear about the wasp that turns cockroaches into zombies. They inject venom into the brain of the cockroach and it, and it messes with their minds, their brains, with using neurotransmitters. It messes up, the chemicals mess up the neurotransmitters such that the cockroach becomes a zombie. And then the, the wasp simply picks up the cockroach, drags it back to its nest, sticks it underground and lays an egg inside the cockroach. And then that egg will hatch and it will eat the cockroach from the inside out. These are parasitoids, they are just almost as awesome as social wasps. Social wasps are my favourites though. And when you see a wasp out flying, um, the yellow jackets, for example, that you'll see at your picnic, um, they are usually off hunting. And if you just take a moment to watch them, you'll see them flitting around in the grass or even dive bombing bees on flowers. It's really fascinating to watch their incredible behaviour on how they forage. But these adults just, just be a bit nicer to them because they are not the, hun the carnivores. They're not out there to eat those bees and flies and caterpillars. They are out there to catch that prey, to bring it back to their colony and feed it to the brood because it's actually the brood, the developing larvae that are the carnivores. Huh. Um, and so the adults are the vegetarians and the brood are the carnivores, but they really need that protein for them to develop. So actually, those, those wasps that you see out flying, they are just uh, bidding the call of the larvae in their nest, and they are simply feeding those larvae. And those larvae, when they get back to the nest with that, uh, that prey, they are giving them a sugary reward. It's like a little treat. It's like Easter, Easter eggs, yay! Um, they get a little bit of a treat, a sugary reward, and that makes, that keeps them going, and that nourishes the adult wasps. And the reason why the adult wasps start to get a bit more bothersome towards the end of the summer is because there aren't that many larvae in the nest. And so they no longer need to uh, provision the larvae with prey, but those adults still do need a sugary, uh, sugary nutrition to keep them going. Um, and that's why they end up coming to your, your picnic because they're after your sugary drinks or your sugary snacks. Now, the whole nature of wasps being um, predators makes them incredibly useful in biocontrol. They are natural pest controllers that we can use. In fact, parasitoid wasps are used to help reduce the number of insects that damage crops in agriculture. So wasps are really, really important in that respect. So just as bees are really good and important for pollination, uh, wasps are really important for, um, for pest control. And without wasps, a world without wasps, where would we be? Well, we're not entirely sure, but we would certainly be in a place with a lot more other insects around. Um, there is not a lot of research done into how much wasps eat, but what we do know is that they eat between, they can remove, a single wasp colony can remove between about 0.15 kilos and 23 kilos of insect material from your garden every year. So bearing in mind that an aphid weighs about two milligrams, that means if the wasp colony in your garden only ate aphids in the summer, it would eat, it would remove about 250,000 aphids from your garden. So imagine what your tomato plants would look like without wasps in your garden. 
Um, I can see lots of questions on the chat. So I'm so sorry. I've been so swept up in my excitement um, about wasps. But my top last facts are the smallest insect in the world is a wasp. You got it. And the largest wasp, guess how fast it can fly? 25 miles an hour. It has a wingspan of seven centimetres. It's five centimetres long and it has venom made up of four different types of chemicals, which will dissolve the tissue in your body when it stings you. That's the giant Asian hornet, Vespa mandarina, not to be confused with the, um, the yellow-legged Asian hornet, which is invading um, in Europe here. Okay, I have gone on far too long. I could chat for a lot longer. Um, please do send me some more chats. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm uh, at Waspwoman. Oh, look, I've got this here for you. Um, is that the right way around or is that mirror image? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, you can play a computer game, wasplove.com, which is all about being um, a wasp and, and raising a wasp colony. So you can get some real insights into the soap opera of the wasp. And if you're, if you'd like to, if you're between the ages of about eight, Eight and 15 and you'd like to uh, read more about wasps I have written um, a sort of uh, a, a more um, user-friendly article about why wasps are important um, if you google do not swap the wasp you'll find it very easily it's in Frontiers Young Minds magazine this has been a storm I really hope that I've convinced you a little teeny bit to love wasps a bit more than you did at the start and possibly to be convinced that wasps are if not as interesting and important, maybe a little bit more interesting and important than bees. Thank you very much. You've been an awesome audience. Please tune in for the next um, Earth Live session. And thank you, Lizzie, again for giving me the chance to share some wasp love with the world. Bye bye. <laughs>